Hello and welcome to the Fit for Privacy podcast, the podcast for those who care about privacy. I'm your host Punit Bhatia and here we have conversations with industry leaders about their perspectives, ideas and opinions relating to privacy and data protection matters. Before we start, a quick disclaimer that the views and opinions expressed are not legal advice. So let's get started. Hello and welcome. My name is Punit Bhatia and I welcome you to the season two of Fit for Privacy podcast. What better way to kick off the season two than to have a conversation with a guest who is no stranger to Fit for Privacy podcast and she has been here in the earlier episodes already. I'm talking about someone who's a policy expert, expert in policy matters relating to data economy, has an opinion and expertise on a variety of topics ranging from artificial intelligence to privacy to antitrust and so on. She loves public speaking and she loves writing. And I have had the privilege of writing AI and Privacy How to Find Balance book with her. I'm talking about none other than Eileen Shivo. Eileen, welcome. Hi, Punit. Thank you for having me. We talk about AI and artificial intelligence and technology and so on. And then we talk about privacy. And people tend to see them as two things apart. How do you see the AI and privacy in that context? Do you see them as friends? Do you see them as foes? And how do they operate? So, well, in the book, we we do make the case for this optimistic view that AI and privacy can coexist, while it's true that they appear to be frenemies, let's say. So we're trying to reconcile those two concepts that are often opposed in the debate. And that's the way forward, I think, because you can't do one uh, without doing the other. Both are really in the world right now. So we decided to deal with how to respect privacy while innovating through the use of AI and how to respect privacy while using AI. Uh, It's ambitious. It's not meant to be pretentious, but that's what we try to do, right? Um, To answer your question more specifically, there are many discussions around uh, privacy that reflect a narrative um, that implicitly connects its erosion potentially to technological progress and in particular the rise of AI and assumptions include that you know in the past we we had greater privacy and that there will be soon none left after technologies increasingly invade our our lives and there's also the opinion that laws and and principle-based frameworks don't cover AI or don't protect uh, people's privacy from AI. But I believe, especially in Europe, that we actually do have strong safeguards in place. And then it's a matter of ensuring that you can still develop a technology for its benefits while protecting privacy. The law is not the enemy of technology. It's often lagging behind because you know, they progress so fast technologies, but if you carefully design the law, it can really prevent the risks um, without impeding the benefits. So of course, we're not promoting the view that AI is a silver bullet. Um, uh, you know, I think knowing more about AI through that angle can really help you um, make sure that you have less subjective judgment of what it's about, or, you know, if you see what I mean, we're not we're not saying either that you should sometimes ignore privacy requirements. You really can't anymore. Even uh, big firms are now increasingly competing on how much privacy they can they can they can provide to people. Uh, so it's an expectation. Uh, but at the same time, there are trade offs. I think a good example and uh, we talk about it in the book is when you have to comply with legal requirements like the limitation of how much data you can collect on people to feed your systems because ai is quite data hungry and it needs quite a bit of it you know it's still in many systems to be able to deliver uh, accurate results and perform without unintended consequences so if you are able to collect less data you might have a challenge when it comes to ensuring your data sets are representative that it's got enough information and variables to be able to address uh, different categories of people um, so to to really end on that note that there is merit in engaging in, in reflections to better understand interactions between privacy and, uh, and AI and to build an optimistic case. It may seem counterintuitive at first, but AI, like other technologies before, um, and privacy are not incompatible. There are ways to make AI work for privacy. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> well, I do think, uh, like anything else, it's important to find a balance. You need to do both AI and privacy. It's not a question of and or. And the debate around whether they are friends or foes doesn't matter. You 
want to leverage on technology. So that's where AI and robotics will help you. And you want to be protecting people's identities and uh, people's uh, personal data. And that's where privacy will come in. So it's not a question of uh, or debate. It's a question of how do you do it? And there you need to find a fine balance wherein you are able to take care of business interests as well as able to respect the privacy laws that exist. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, very soon we will also have some AI laws in addition to the guidance we have. So it'll further make sure that you are in a framework and in the balance. Yeah, sounds reasonable. <laughs> yeah. And now we often talk about GDPR as the legislation or one of the legislation, especially in Europe for data protection. How is the legislation space around artificial intelligence? Are there a lot of legislation or are we all in guidance space only? That's a good question. Uh, we could spend the day on this, but uh, I'll try to be <laughs> short. Um, it's, a, it's a fragmented landscape, you could say. So obviously, with the rise of AI systems, you know, there's been a rise in, in ethical and human rights based frameworks in recent years to guide how you develop and use uh, AI technologies. So far, it's been mainly about developing principled AI. Uh, so values and principles we'd like to see implemented. Um, but for now, there isn't really, you could say, AI specific legislation. Uh, there's a race to legislation uh, because countries want to be able to be the first to create the rules, to have their values reflected. And in particular, the EU wants to become that first region to develop a dedicated rule book uh, for AI. And there are initiatives that are well on the way. There's still a lot of discussion going on. We'll likely see progress this year. And then you have the OECD, the Global Partnership on AI, the Council of Europe, so many international intergovernmental organizations in many, many countries, including the US and China, which we also look at in the book. They, they've developed um, or are about to table their own part of the, of the homework. Uh, there's an interesting study by the Berkman Klein Center, and you can visualize 36 AI frameworks, and, and it shows there is growing consensus around some uh, trends. Uh, so privacy is one, safety and security, fairness, um, human control, promotion of human values and professional responsibility. And the hope is that they're, you know, if these make their ways into hard rules, they could garner or gather consensus, um, uh, you know, among like like minded nations, you could say, to maximize the benefits of AI while minimizing its risks. So it's an important conversation to follow. Now, there is, of course, existing legislation that already applies to technologies like AI. Uh, and the EU, again, for example, the privacy law called the GDPR, which came into force in, in 2018, it does cover and impact technologies including because uh, it covers the processing of automated decision uh, making uh, systems and, and because AI is a lot about data, of course. Sure. And how do you see this evolving in coming years? You mentioned that this year or early next year, we will have a legislation on AI in Europe. Do you see that happening in <laughs> other parts of the world or every country then getting into a, a AI law? like we had a few years ago, GDPR leading the way on privacy law, and then we have 100 plus countries passing their own privacy laws, very similar principle based around GDPR, but in their own way. Do you see that happening in AI also? Well, I don't have a crystal ball. Well, it's not with me right now, but <laughs> uh, there are calls to update um, the laws like the GDPR already to make it more fit for purpose for you know new and emerging technologies or for those technologies that we haven't anticipated yet but might emerge in the future and there are also existing frameworks like for uh, product liability and machinery laws that pol policymakers are currently looking at to see if you know that could be complemented by additional uh, rules that would be specific to ai um, I think it's likely that nations will continue to compete to ensure that their own legislation on AI is tabled, first of all, and then in parallel, there are signs that it could be that they work together within multilateral frameworks and organizations to adopt common rules. It's, it's hard to really bet on which will happen first. Yeah. In, in some countries, they've decided not to regulate AI and to keep this principle based. I think in Singapore, that's the case. 
But one thing I can say with, with a good degree of certainty is that AI legislation will happen. <laughs> yeah. So essentially, we will see a lot of movement, a lot of new laws, new principles, new regulation or new guidance, at least coming in this space from each and every country. And this is, will remain an area of activity. Yeah, I think you could say that. <laughs> yeah, good. And now that if we say AI and privacy matter, and if they do matter, the question is, how do you find balance? And then what are your views around how do you find balance as an organization, as a person working on AI projects? So you're, you're, you're asking two questions here. One would be why do AI and privacy matter? And then how do you manage to, to kind of have those two coexist, right? When it comes to AI, why it matters, uh, you know, companies are using AI to drive more efficient operations and processes to transform their business models, to personalize their products. And many of the, you know, the success of organizations is set already today to, to you know, in their ability to, to automate uh, processes using AI to boost productivity. And the, the economic value of, of AI that's being projected, it's difficult to predict, but it's seen as the biggest commercial opportunity. So it's a critical asset for competitive differentiation of companies, but also for nations. And you might have heard of this global AI race that's going on. When it comes to why privacy matters, it's been you know, in some ways, part of, of a lot of our human and societal concerns for a long time and the changes around us and, and progress in technologies have meant that you have technologies that can be used to enhance privacy, but can also impact it negatively if they're being misused. Right. So that's why alongside headline grabbing scandals we've seen emerging, say, over the past five years, at least, uh, on, you know, on how our data is being used. Well, that's why privacy is increasingly discussed as a value, even as a human right that you have to protect. Uh, and it, it, it matters not just from a human rights perspective, but, but also because regulators have been stepping in in ways that they never did before to ensure that privacy is something organizations have to uh, respect. But before, I mean, maybe before we discuss how to find a balance, I was wondering, because you're the privacy expert, so why why would privacy matter in, in your view? Well, privacy matters because every one of us has privacy needs. And when I say that, you talk to any person and you ask them what's their name and they will happily share their name. And then you ask them where do they come from? They will happily let you know where do they come from. And then you get into are you married or do you have a partner? And it gets a little bit uncomfortable. Now, almost 50% of people would be like, why? Why do you want to know about it? And then you get to the next question saying, uh, which bank do you use? And it's uncomfortable. And then you say, what's your bank account number? And then you say, what's your password? So in a space of six or seven questions, you see from the degree of comfort shifting, the first question, what's your name being very comfortable and what's your bank account number or password? It's completely uncomfortable and very, I mean, almost nobody would allow you your uh, password unless it's a family member. Maybe even then people will have reservations. So it's a question of choice. It's a question of comfort. And that's what privacy is. Now, somebody maybe will be OK to share and it depends on who you are with. Yeah. Maybe if you are with a deep friend for last 10 years, you would share which bank you use, uh, who's your partner, how he is, he's good, bad, or she's good, bad, all that's okay. So it's the degree of comfort in a context, and that's privacy. So where you are and what you want to share, you have a choice and you want to respect that. And if I push that person to share more than they are comfortable, they feel their privacy is violated. So that's why privacy matters. So that's in general context. But when we are giving that data to an organization, we respect or we expect that same respect of our choices, our context to be taken care of. Just because I give my credit card number to a company for processing of, let's say, the hotel bill, which we are not traveling that much in a pandemic, but I expect that to stay there. I don't expect that to be charged later on, one month later, and say, uh, you can charge me whenever you wish. No, you can charge me now, and it's only now. After that, forget about that credit card number. So that's privacy. That's privacy matters. And then companies need to respect it. And since it's a matter of individual, because even in these seven questions, depends on the context, where do you decide, who decides, 
it becomes challenging option and when it becomes that challenging the question is who decides mm-hmm. your version my version or somebody else's version and do you have to live with somebody else's version no and that's where privacy laws fit in saying this is the boundary this is how we define boundary and everyone else has his own uh, boundary that they can define but this is the bare minimum common ex- uh, uh, say level of privacy expectation we have that is what we are talking about transparency or respect for uh, purpose and not keeping data any longer than necessary so that's why privacy is important and when it comes to technology for me it's even more important because technology you don't know what it can do with data and half of the things we believe or it's perceived happens automatically yeah and i like how you point you know to the element of context it's super important dimension when discussing privacy so yeah absolutely agree right so the second part was <laughs> yeah we still have to answer that that question so how do we find balance of course in our book we elaborate on it but uh, uh, it will be very unfair on our listeners to say read the book but yeah. what how do you find balance in essence so i think well we're, we're saying that these two things basically here's what you know they mean to you here's how they interact here's how you can deal with it and within all that what's relevant to you i think it's really important to really look at both these concepts and look at your own uh, organization its processes values mission then you prioritize what would work and what would be really meaningfully uh, addressing all this and it depends also on the products and the services you're developing depends on your customers too and the message we, we tend to recall is that there are many resources and perspectives and guidelines and and that's you know the only way up is to make our proposal your own and then you keep on learning so what we proposed you know to find balance between ai and privacy is is to take into consideration a number of principles we've taken them from existing frameworks and guidelines so human control lawfulness transparency accountability etc i'm not going to spoil everything <laughs> um and you you also need to measure the trade offs we say so for instance on explainability it can be really difficult to explain in simple terms how a system works you, you often can't oversimplify it but there are ways that you can do so while respecting the requirements that you know are set in the law and we we also flag it's a recurrent issue for many organizations so that you're not alone in this and some some other principles are more straightforward than explainability like like security we saying this is this is a must not just for your your customers and and how that can impact them but also the long term sustainability and the reputation of your business so the the consideration of various trade offs is a good way to start the the journey towards finding balance and some things you can do is to look at the objective at your system and what it really really needs and what it doesn't need so much of so you you can ensure you know that the data you will be using for a virtual assistant is necessary to provide a service for instance so let's imagine also you're a car rental company uh, and and your customers are using your your chatbot to book a car you may need data like whether these customers have the right age to be allowed to drive uh, but you don't necessarily need the exact age you can just uh, ask are you um, you know above 18 or can you show me your driving license potentially you may not need to know exactly where they will be going maybe just to know if they will be going abroad sometimes they do ask you that question uh you know you, you don't necessarily need their home address just the address of the place where they may, may be uh, dropping the car afterwards you know so that's really some kind of like an example of what you need to really figure out is really important um and then balance is really about involving people uh you need balance in the perspectives of the people around the table to to drive your decisions that will be fair um appropriate um acceptable and accepted and you need to raise that awareness to ensure everyone gets a chance to um assess you know uh, and agree on things you need to take really a hard look as you know as to how to involve them when uh and then what we recommend um uh, for that uh, is to to convey some rules and responsibilities in your projects uh, so for instance you'll have uh, someone covering for legal perspective or also recommending someone for the financial perspective the societal perspective and so on and we also adjust we offer ways to adjust um that effort depending on if you're like a big or smaller firm so you you need to bring in legal 
risk management, the people who are building the AI systems, put them into the same room and help them speak the same language. You have to bring in the right people and marry those two um, sub areas that are often distinct and that's technology and culture. And they are seen as distinct, but you have to reconcile them somehow. And that takes a lot of work. Indeed it is. I mean, in nutshell, what you're saying is have a principle best approach look at different perspectives, get people around the table, and then know your purpose, and then according to that purpose, drive this entire exercise. That's very uh, interesting. Now, if somebody wants to buy this book, where can they find the book that we've written? So they can find it and buy it on Amazon, and they can order it as an ebook or also as a print version. How does it feel to have your first book written? Oh, it's been exactly what I wanted it to be and, and why I wanted to do this in, in the first place. Um, it's been a great learning experience. Um, when we decided to, to go ahead and write this book together, uh, we used the, the method that you, you rightly recommended, which was about really building a precise structure for the book. And I remember that you mentioned uh, it would make it efficient, but also fun. Uh, and looking back at this, uh, but also while writing the book, I, I realized I never felt like it was something I really had to force myself to, to work on the way sometimes you would have to do when, you know, completing some tasks at work. So it was it was extremely positive. I don't think I'd have done that easily on my own. Um, of course, it would have been a completely different project, but would have been more painful without having those tips on the methodology that um, that you shared with me. And you have written a lot of publications and you have published in many newspapers on many publications like New York Times, Washington Post and Politico. So how is this experience of writing a book different from writing an article or writing a paper? Well, it was more a creative writing because it was not um, an assignment that, you know, you, you have a topic that has to be a very short text and has to convey a perspective and an opinion on something. I think we, we went for something more, actually just like the title, something more balanced in the, in the perspective. And, you know, it was very positive in the, in the sense that the process was, was different and it was great. I mean, we had different interactions to touch base. So also I was not the only uh, pair of hands writing the book. Um, and that gave us also discipline, a sense of progress quite regularly. Uh, when you know you you write a book, it's not just something you you wrap up within a few days. So you have to make sure you you maintain the distance uh, and and you have a sense of of clear direction. Uh, I think we had a good way to split work amongst uh, ourselves, and we had that complementarity, right? You you, yeah. you would provide some con concise input on which I really enjoyed elaborating on, and on the other hand, I'd give you a bit of heavier chunks of text to review, which is. <laughs> you know, something you actually said you like to work with. So I think we 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 really got along in this process uh, and, and giving, you know, writing a book with four hands give you a sense of commitment, motivation and, and in a way freedom um, because of the creativity. And so the learning process was quite interesting for, for me. Yeah. Yeah. I think when I look at it, people think that writing an article is one time job. You write in one hour and you write 40 or 50 articles and you can publish in a book. That's the perception that they have. But it's not as simple as that. It's about making them connect, making them flow. Yeah, exactly. It's a very different process. And you really have to get along if you're not the only one writing the, the article as well. Indeed. That's also the complementarity is also very important. I was also skeptical mm -hmm. when I chose to co-author, but it worked well, as mm -hmm. you said. Uh, so talking about content, because it's about AI, privacy, I mean, people tend to see them as some of them friends, some of them say it's foes, more, there are more people who say it's foes. But why should somebody read this book from your perspective? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we can start with the technical profile of a reader, um, because you, you, I think you have to be curious. You want to learn about AI and privacy. What is it about these two concepts that that you've heard in the news or in some conversations, but you haven't had the time yet to take a closer look at um, or say you, you, you should read the book because you, you like to read a little bit of theory because it's important, you know, as a foundation for action. But you're also a doer. So you want to find out more concretely how you can improve things say in your organization. And so in this book, I think you'll get both parts. 
Um, and you also get a balanced perspective, which which could, you know, you give you an angle to help you make sure that you have less of a subjective judgment of what it's about. And because we're trying to reconcile those two concepts that are often opposed in the, in the debate. Um, and so now we're saying, you know, both of those things, AI and privacy, are in the world now. You can't do one uh, without doing the other. So that's the way forward. Um, and I think that's, uh, yeah, a few of the reasons. And another one, maybe, if I may, is that question of responsibility. Um, you know, you have an environment that's harder to navigate. AI is crucial for businesses. Uh, you have to use it to compete. Um, so your business model has to be either designed for it or be ready for it. So you have to understand a bit more how this all works so that you can use AI responsibly you know, and in compliance with the current laws that are in place. Great. So if someone is in privacy or in AI or both or wants a perspective, this book is for them. Exactly. Good. We all tend to have favorites. <laughs> and did you have a favorite part in the book? And if it was, why was it a favorite over the other ones? Well, it might surprise you, but I think it's the part that you wrote. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> I should have probably picked a part that I wrote. But um, what came to mind straight away was that, sure. you know, it's it's a part of the book, but it's also a moment where you, you sort of came up with this creative idea to offer that framework with this yeah. specific checklist of roles and responsibilities for, you know, organization to operationalize and, and activate all these principles in practice for AI and privacy. And I think it's a really great um, outcome to, to make sense of all the theory and that really connected all of this, I find. I don't know what you think about it. I think absolutely. I agree with you. We had a lot of good discussions, but then to talk about all the frameworks and then to think and brainstorm, of course, uh, I'm glad you give me the credit, but it was together that we brainstormed and the question was, OK, we talk about all the frameworks of AI. We talk about privacy. What is it? But then what's in it for the reader and how do we make this book a different book? And then the title helped us saying how to find balance. But how do you find balance is you need to have a framework. You need to have principles. You need to have an approach, the do's, the knowns, the critical success factors. And when that idea popped in, uh, OK, my idea, your idea, together our idea, the book started to become our book rather than research and write. So then we were got into a lot of creative writing, a lot of creative thinking. Mm -hmm. And that's when uh, we spent a lot of energy in fine tuning, firming up. How does it and bringing in scenarios? And I think that would also be the favorite part for readers because that's something they will not find. That's called perspective. That's called opinion. That's called framework, whatever they call it. Mm -hmm. They will find it in our book not in other books. They may find it differently, but that's unique. Exactly. And I, I think your experience in the in private sector organizations that are more corporate and working with business clients, you really brought that kind of relevance to it that, um, you know, in my with my background, we're working with uh, think tanks, you know, um, um, you know, lobbyists in Brussels or policymakers. That's not necessarily something that I had in my background. So it was also very helpful uh, to include. Uh, and I think instead of a patchwork of articles and pieces that you'd have to read separately, as you said, you, you have really both of everything, all of that in, in that book, I think. Uh, of course, on the surface, uh, we have to be, uh, you know, it's just it's one book. It's not a, uh, an encyclopedia. But, you know, I think that brings both. Yeah. I think let's maybe help our readers with the structure of the book because we are creating a lot of curiosity by talking about our favorite part of it. So listeners, the book starts with kind of a definition of AI and privacy, very light, gets into different frameworks or the key frameworks we believe are interesting for you to know. You get to know them, then we critique them, and then we finally get into what do you need to do? Because each of these frameworks has a different dimension, different perspective and different benefit, but none of them is complete. So we propose to you, a, in our view, of course, a 360 degree model, which allows you to have a principle based and a framework based approach while using both the judgment and the numeric aspects of it. And we end up with do's and don'ts. And when Eileen says, I did that part. OK, thank you so much. But I missed out on the policy and the administrative part of it, why the 
uh, jurisdictions create policies or laws and that's what Aline brought in. So in essence, our complementarity ensured that we are not only thinking from an organization perspective or the policy administrator or the jurisdiction perspective, we brought all those perspectives together. That's my one takeaway because if you need all those perspectives, all those thinkings, then this book is for you. Exactly. I think a message that we try to really recall throughout the book is that there are many resources and perspectives and, and guidelines and frameworks and principles. And the, you know, that the only way up, we're, we, we say that the only way up is to, to, to make our proposal, um, our framework, to make it your own and then keep on learning. Uh, but you have to do it. Don't miss out on, you know, this world of knowledge either. Indeed. And I think we've ended up in a situation where the book is relevant both as a one-time read as well as something that you'll go back and refer to as you implement your projects. And that's what I'm proud of, that we've together been able to create that. And as we carry on, if I may ask, okay, we do have a favorite, but was there something that was very challenging topic in the book? I mean, you mentioned that our collaboration was smooth, but in terms of the topic that we had or you had from your perspective, quite a challenge in terms of putting in the book or not in the book? And why would you say that was challenging? Yeah, I think it's it's a great question um, because I, I do keep, a, you know, looking back, it's all been positive, but it's also good to, to try to see the lessons learned. And I think it was more, the difficulty was maybe more to accept that we could only touch upon some things on the surface, not because we were lazy writers, but because, you know, for every principle of framework, you could write an entire book. Uh, right. You can talk about geopolitics, the economic implications. It's fascinating, but that was not the idea. The idea was to make it informative and helpful that way. And um, sometimes in my work, providing only the information is not enough. Uh, but we are writing for perhaps a broader or a different uh, audience here. Uh, and we want to really trigger some interest for readers that don't hear about AI and privacy all day long, but that know that they, they know it's important. Um, so, yeah, tr trying to step away from the occupational hazard of always wanting to go too much in depth. That was a bit challenging, but it was important to to stay away from that, because otherwise we would have drowned uh, this book into details and we would have lost the readers. So I think we managed to to swim through it pretty well. And, and, and I hope it will be a, a breeze for, for people to read. Absolutely. I think uh, it would certainly provide people with a perspective provide with the opinion and something to think and something to ponder upon while reusing it as they implement projects. And when we talk about the challenge, I think the challenge for me also was that I'm very uh, cryptic and short. So for me, three bullets and it's done. If you have read the Be Ready for GDPR, it's so short and so sim simple. Of course, some people love to read details and everything. And you have uh, this gift of making it more elaborate. And what we managed to find is the balance between the two. It's yeah. not too long. It's not too short. If I had written it, it maybe would have been 70, 60% of what it, it is. And if you had written by yourself, it would have been 140%. But we managed the 100% somewhere in between. And we also found the balance between being too detailed and too uh, high level. Exactly. Yeah, that's spot on. <laughs> yeah. So uh, everybody says their book is unique. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's a good sell. We have the right to say that, right? <laughs> we do. We're saying that. <laughs> so from a listener's perspective or reader's perspective, how is this book different from other books? Because there are some books on AI, some books on privacy, and maybe I haven't checked uh, in between a book on AI and privacy, probably. But how would somebody find this unique? I think we sort of mentioned that a little earlier in the conversation right. um but um that's the way indeed in which we we managed to to touch upon and inform about policy and governance aspects at, at a high level as well as practical technical and organizational aspects to make those very relevant to business practitioners and bringing both these worlds of, of work and expertise together. I don't think that's very common. I think we managed to reconcile things that are often opposed in a debate or at least show it's possible to accept both and deal with both without ideology. 
And also it's bringing in, so I mean, I would say both the academic rigor and the business relevance and, and not too much theory, just about enough. And then what you need to connect it to what's really more concrete. So we're making the implementation of these concepts relevant to business priorities. I think that's where the difference is. I don't know how you feel about this. I fully share and endorse your view. I think we managed to find a perfect balance because sometimes you write a book and when it's in publishing, which is then you start to think like, mm, I could have done this. I should have done this. I would have, could have, should have. But in this case, I don't have those could have, should have. I have like we've given the right and optimal level of information and with enough for people to start acting because as they start acting, they will find their way. They will maybe say, let's get the OECD framework or European framework or US framework. But then they have options to choose from. But in a very short span of time, uh, if they read our book, they will get a 360 degree perspective and a balanced perspective. That's the most important thing because you talk to privacy people. Oh, no, AI and to AI people. Oh, no, privacy is going to kill us. They don't want us. And we eventually in the end have managed to balance that perspective. I mean, of course, we also had those uh, imbalances in opinion when we started long back. But over time, we realigned and readjusted and readapted. And now that uniqueness has come through. And it's uniqueness because we thought through uniqueness because we took time and it also because it was our intention. I mean, our, the word we chose was how to find balance. And we consistently were reminding ourselves in every discussion saying if it's balance, does it fit in or not? Mm -hmm. That's very true. Yeah. Yeah. So we all know that there are challenges when it comes to AI and privacy. Would you like to articulate the biggest challenge when it comes to AI and privacy? Of course. Uh, that's why they need to read the book. But what is the biggest challenge? So when when you understand the implications of AI, you, you I think you realize that it's not something that you plug in and play. Um, it's not it's not a game. It's not a goal either. It's a tool, and it's a tool that can greatly you know contribute to achieving a goal. But you know while um, solutions that are AI based are an opportunity to increase efficiency, productivity, you know, uh, create wealth. Um, you are increasingly subject to more rules and responsibilities to ensure that the privacy of individuals, because, you know, customers and laws are holding you uh, increasingly accountable for, for using technologies like AI and rightly so. So for many organizations that, that involve securing, you know, those anchors of trust, like the resilience of your system, monitoring the performance, you know, complying with existing or forthcoming norms and rules. And it involves a lot of new governance frameworks and to monitor all that. And, and that layer of red tape and, and complexity is difficult and it's expensive. So my, my hope is that um, all organizations um, can improve the processes, you know, to, to, to be able to develop good systems that comply and protect privacy while you know having you know still having the resources they need for innovation and it's hard to pay attention to to both and and to perform on, on both um and and maybe another challenge if i if i have a bit of time to add um i think it's the multi the multiplicity of the meanings and the definitions when it comes to ai and privacy culturally when you know and we talk about this in the book i think uh, privacy can can be subjective and on top of that learning about ai and privacy comes with an overwhelming number of resources and, and learning materials available and it's difficult for business leaders to to find the roadmap and the timeline to be able to learn efficiently so yeah yeah indeed and when we talk about books every author has a message and here with two of us so what is the one key message in this book that, according to you, we are delivering? Uh, so overall, I think we are saying, OK, there's these two things. Here's what they mean to you or what they can mean to you. Here's how they interact. And here's how you can deal with, you know, within all that to deal with 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 what's really relevant to you. And overall, we, we do make this case. Uh, for an optimistic view that, you know, maybe not neutral, but optimistic that AI and privacy can, can coexist while they appear to be to be frenemies. Uh, I would say that's the key message, uh, but I'd, I'd be curious to know what do you think would be the one key message of our book? 
Well, it's aligned. Uh, I believe uh, when you say that I will share the same thing, but I paraphrase it in a different way. I think when it comes to AI and privacy, there are different views and those views tend not to align. And we made a case that the alignment is possible while balancing the AI interest, which is more business driven and privacy interest, which is more legally driven or compliance driven and balancing the two. That's what we have aimed at. And that's what we've been very successful to an extent, because when we started, we didn't see that. But when we ended, we saw how it's possible, how it's uh, doable. And that's the essence of our book, the balance. I think that's the core word. I agree. Good. So the question I maybe if I can put you on spot, do you believe <laughs> that the balance between AI and privacy really is feasible now that you've written this book? Yeah, so I think I do. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't have written this book with you, right? <laughs> um, right. Um, deep down, though, and, and if you read a little bit of stuff on those topics, I mean, you, you can quickly become a skeptic uh, because yeah. we humans, we, we tend to think sometimes more narrowly than, than we're capable of. And we're all in our bubble and accepting that two things that seem to be in contradiction with each other can actually be, you know, can work with each other. That's maybe a challenge. Um, and I think um, it, 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 when it comes to striking the balance, I think it really depends on, on, on strong willed uh, leaders. Uh, for instance, in our, you know, for our approach to work, you need to bring in legal um, risk management and, you know, the people that are building the systems, put them in the same room and help them speak the same language. And you have to bring in the right people and and marry two areas that have often been viewed as distinct, which is technology and culture. And I think that takes that takes work. And and actually, you, you could say it takes a village even. Indeed. And I would fully share that view. I mean, it was challenging, but we managed to find the balance for the newsmakers, for those skeptics. They will always find things, challenges, issues to say, no, this is not possible. This is too optimistic and all that, but there's a way. And as you said earlier, we can't change the fact that there are privacy laws and we will not be able to change the fact that there will be more and more automation. Exactly. So both things are a reality. The question now is, are you going to find the balance or are you going to continue the debate? Mm -hmm. What we are aiming to do is to get the debate shifted to finding a balance and saying, how do we live with both of them together and the perspectives that you need to look at to find a balance. Yeah, that's right. Hmm. Good. So would you write another book given this uh, <laughs> experience? For sure. Yeah, um, because now I know I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you, Pradit, for the adventure. Um, I, I will I will also tell people I already do uh, to, to seek your help if they want to write a book, because I, I really realized it wasn't as hardcore and inaccessible as I thought. And, and uh, but I might if I I'm, I might write a book that has nothing to do with anything serious policy and business stuff, though. It's something that uh, would be building on a blog that I used to host mm -hmm. when I was a little younger and on some notes that I've been keeping on, on people's idiosyncrasies, you know, in places I lived and environments where I worked. So that would be some sort of a personal pet project. But maybe there will be other books that are useful to you know organizations and i very much enjoyed the that that kind of t building a tool with a purpose so yeah it was great good so as always it was good to have a conversation with you of course like, we had right? many conversations between the podcast recording last time and this time but a recorded conversation if i may say a more formal conversation so thank you so much for your time and uh, for having if me the readers want to see or read or find the book then it's on amazon and for now thank you so much for being here it's a and pleasure wish, as always. yeah thank you so much and i wish uh, we will have a lot of people coming up and coming up with reviews and feedback and would like the book and all the best to you thank you likewise and thank you everybody Thanks for listening and now we ask you for some help. Take a moment to subscribe and review this podcast. Your support matters. And if you have done it already, thank you so much. Now, if you have questions or suggestions, drop an email at hello at fitforprivacy.com. And finally, if you know someone 
who will benefit from this share this podcast with them and help us grow thank you so much stay safe and see you next time